Go ahead and open your Bibles to the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. We are continuing in our teaching from the book of Ephesians. We've uh, covered the first three chapters. Remember the key words of the first three chapters was what Jesus has what Jesus has done. done. It's the grace of God. A, it, it is teaching how the grace of God has been made available to us, etc. so forth. Ephesians chapter 4 starts out with what uh, we are to do. So we found out that there is a Godward and a manward side to walking with God. Amen. That the blessings of God are conditional. There are conditions on things. Well, I'm going to be healed no matter what. Well, I can tell you what, some sick folk that ain't getting healed no matter what. You know, um, and we, we just, you know, we have to be careful not to take something that we would create as what we would call our, our own personal narrative of the Bible. You know, if you take a, a position of grace is everything and there's nothing else, then you begin to take that preferred narrative and put it in places and you begin to interpret the Bible in, in a skewed manner. Amen. We have to take the whole counsel of God's Word. And God's Word is the Bible. Jesus is the Word of God. The Bible is also. I got somebody tell me, somebody wrote the other day, the Bible is not God's Word. Jesus is. Oh yeah, and, and they didn't, and, and, when the, and the New Testament preachers didn't have a Bible. Well, then how do they say as it is written? You know, and that all Scripture is profitable. What was Paul talking about? Jesus is the Scripture. No, that's not, that's not what he was talking about. And so we're, we're, what's happening is here, there's a, there's a narrative out there of extreme grace that there's so many Scriptures that deny what they teach out of that extreme teaching. Now listen, that's not the, gra it's not the true biblical grace of God they're teaching. They're teaching an extreme uh, position on it. Amen. That I don't have to do anything, I don't have to tithe, I don't have to give, I don't have to go to church, I don't have to submit, I don't have to obey, I don't have to do this, I don't have to do that, da 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 You know, it's just I look at the finished work of Jesus, that's all I ever do. Those are extreme positions. I said those are extreme positions. And because of that, they've created a narrative that's untenable. And so now you're getting people coming out saying, well, you know, it's Jesus in me, he's the living word, that's all I need. Now then everything's open to interpretation. One guy told me because he knows that he's, he's right based because he has good fruit in his life. Oh, now you're judging whether you're right or wrong by your personal life. Wow. By the fruit in your life. Now, Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit, but he didn't sure say you present your fruit as your, your testimony. Amen. 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 So, we've covered Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. There's a lot of don't do's. There's a lot of stops. There's a lot of, you know, uh, this is the way you're supposed to do it. Walk worthy of the vocation that you're called to walk in. Amen. Uh, so forth and so on. And then we get into Ephesians chapter 6. I, I love 6.1. That just, that, that, you talk about annihilating any argument some people have. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Amen. Paul quoted an Old Testament commandment with a promise and used it and says that it may be wealthy, you may live long on the earth. Use that to, to say something. He didn't say, children, you're under grace. You're going to have to live long and be, on, and be on the earth a long time just because you're under grace. He said, obey your parents. Honor your father and mother because there's a commandment with promise. And it was an Old Testament commandment Amen. that he quoted and stated and said, here's the results of it. Woo! That'll mess up somebody's uh, extreme theologies. Amen. It'll mess up some faith people's theology. Well, I don't have to, you know, uh, you know, that's works. Well, he's, I don't care what you call it. The Bible said do it. Amen. You can call it works, obedience. You can call it living under some type of supernatural guidance and sovereignty of God that I, I did this, you know, because God made me do it. I don't care what you call it. it you're told to do it. Amen. And it's because you're told to do it, you're supposed to do it. Amen. And if you do do it the way God said do it, then there's a promise that goes with it. You'll have long life on the earth. Amen. Okay, now moving down. We were down at verse 10 last week. Finally, my brethren, this is really where we're kind of picking up now. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, strategies, stratagems of the devil. We're to put on how much of the armor? The whole armor. Not part of it. Not your favorite doctrine. Not the part you really love. Not the I don't have to go to church. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to give. I don't have to obey. I don't have to submit part of the armor. Hello? Amen. Not your pet doctrine armor. The whole armor. Amen. 
Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the, once again, whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the, withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. One translation says, and having fought the battle to the end, remain on the battlefield ready to do battle again. In other words, for the believer, we don't get to, you know, fight, win a battle, and go sit down and do nothing. We always remain, remain in the position of the conqueror, occupier of our victory. Amen. We do not, we don't, we don't take vacations from faith. Amen. Amen. You don't take vacations from believing. Amen. I can tell you, a little slumber, a little sleep, a little folding of the hands, and that, sudden, that poverty shall come on thee. I'm going to tell you, you start taking faith vacations, you're going to get in trouble. Amen. We live by faith. Yeah. Amen. We walk by faith. Y'all here, you're going home. Okay. We're here. Is everything okay? Everything? Okay. I thought something was wrong. What have I done wrong? Okay. You, you don't have the opportunities to take vacations when it comes to faith. You know, when you, you live by faith. If you listen, you don't, how many take vacations from breathing? Hello? Well, your body lives by oxygen, man. You got to breathe. You got to live by faith. Amen. And so, uh, he says, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. You, you, you fight the devil, you whip the devil, you beat the devil, you beat, you beat his attacks, you win the battle, blah, 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 all whatsoever and so on. And then, you're ready to go again. Yeah. Hop up, dude. Just get up one more time. I'm going to take you down the second you get up. Amen. But I can tell you, if you turn your back and go sit down, he'll look for that opportunity he'll jump you. He'll jump you in a heartbeat. We don't have to. You just got to live by faith. Got to stay out there. Amen. So it says, Wherefore take into you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, <clears throat> having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching and thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We'll stop there. So Paul begins to use a, a metaphor for the armor of God, uh, much like that of the Roman soldier. Now, I know many people have heard this teaching before. Heard I'm not going to go into the depth of some people and get into every aspect of it in super depth, because uh, I don't want to overemphasize the Roman armor. I want to I emphasize the armor of God. Amen. Now, um, in doing so, Paul was using a metaphor and, uh, of, the, of the armor that the Romans wore. And so he first of all talked about having your loins girt about with truth. Now, the Roman belt held everything together. The breastplate was put on. It was tied to the belt. The, the, the uh, front, frontal uh, shields for the, uh, the uh, thighs and the shins were all tied and tied to the belt, kept them up. In other words, <clears throat> remember, the, 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 and the Roman breastplate covered the front and the back. Okay, it went over to the front and the back and was hooked to this belt. The, belt, the, shit, the sword went into its weapon. We went into the belt. But notice he said, your loins go about with truth. You see, truth holds everything in place. You can have on the breastplate of righteousness. You can have the sword of the spirit. You can have all this stuff. But if, you, if, you're, if it's not held in place by truth, you can get into error. You can get, in, you can get off. Now, the word truth here is not epinosis which is clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge. It is aletheia. Okay? Now, this word is used um, to denote that which is true and correct, that which is certain and on which one can depend, uh, that which is pure and genuine. Um, and it also, and principally, the concept of truth found in the New Testament centers on Jesus Christ. Okay, so here we have <clears throat> a truth that is clear and precise, or, or uh, clear, um, see, I'm sorry, true and correct, um, pure and genuine, amen? The Bible tells us to rightly divide the word of truth. In other words, you know, uh, the Bible talks about those who take the word of God and, and use it, you know, every wind of doctrine, and they, they lie in wait to, to deceive with cunning craftiness. So you can take truth and use it and push it to an extreme and use it for cunning craftiness. You can take prosperity and push it to the point where you're using it just to get rich off of as a minister. 
You can go to a church. You can get some scriptures about prosperity, return, about giving to a minister, and then tell everybody, I got a thousand fold anointing tonight. If you'll give to me, God's going to call, call, call. What are they doing? See, that's not pure and genuine truth. It's misapplied or extremed truth. And that's not a word, but and so, and a truth pushed to an extreme for the purpose of personal gain or personal manipulation. And you see, if you as a believer, and, and listen, you can't just go out here and use some truth to get people to follow you. I, I know there are Christians who just love to have their own followings. We had a guy in our church when we first came to the town. He, he, he thought he was, well, anyway, we don't want to go there. And he would take Bible and he would he would he would manipulate scriptures and make and, and get people to you know be basically under his spell. He was using it to create his own following. Uh, to make, for some reason, it gave him some type of personal uh, well well being or worth to manipulate people. One day he called me on the phone to tell me they were leaving the church. Uh, they were they were leaving the church and that's because I caught him on some stuff. You know, he was manipulating stuff, and, 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 and basically I caught it, you know, Pentecostal witchcraft. You gave me enough information about a situation to get me to act in a certain way, withholding the rest of the information all the time, wanting me to do something a certain way. So you, get, you inform, inform me about something just to get me to do something a certain way, and then when I find out that's what you did, I called you on it. I'm leaving the church. So he, he kept pushing my buttons. Finally got me a little ticked off on the phone. If I'm telling you, if it had been in my face, I was really young then, I probably would have laid hands on him. <laughs> and not the Bible way. <laughs> Hard, fast, and continuously. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I almost was trying to envision using my faith to be able to go through the phone and grab his neck. <laughs> so he spun me up. Oh, you shouldn't get spun up as a minister. Jesus ran all those guys out of the temple. Yeah. I don't think he went in there. I'm now running you out of the temple. Whip, 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 whip. He went and turned their tables over, beat them with the things, and ran them out. Yeah, man. Hello? I just got to believe there's some righteous indignation that was showing up there. So anyway, he does this, and then he stops and goes, I've lowered my voice. I'm speaking. So You know why? Because a soft answer turns away wrath. Yeah. Well, that's not pure and genuine truth. That is a manipulation of truth for your gain to position you in another. No, truth has to be pure and genuine. Truth has to be uh, true and, ac and correct, true and accurate. If you're going to have truth and it's going to be true and accurate or true and correct, that means you're going to have to be a student of the Word and rightly divide the Word of truth. Well, how do I rightly divide the Word of truth? It has to bear the scrutiny of the whole counsel of the Word of God. Not, not, not the whole counsel of everybody else in the world, <clears throat> but the whole counsel of the Word of God. Amen? Now, let me give you an example. If you go to Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24, and we, we've heard, we heard uh, Dad Hagen teach along these lines a number, 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 number of times. Um, I mean, actually, I, just, I finally started when he walked into the classroom and I wrote down more. I just wrote down my main text, Mark 11, 23, and 24. I don't think I ever had to mark through that once. Because, you know, that's just, you know, that was, his, that was what he based his ministry on. And that's because of what the Lord told him to do. But, you know, it says in there that, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So, we, we know, and then people start teaching and, and preaching. And Dad had a book called You Can Have What You Say. <coughs> and uh, so people go, out, I can have what I say. And they start believing somebody else's wife. Start believing somebody else's car. Somebody else's house. Da, da, da. Well, that position, does that bear up under the weight of all Scripture? Amen. No. That extreme position doesn't. Well, number one, you can't have somebody else's wife. If someone looks on somebody else, another woman to lust after her has committed adultery. Amen. Adultery's wrong. I'm under grace. I don't care what you're under. Adultery's wrong. One couple told a pastor friend of mine, they were living together, he said, and they were having relationship problems. They said, well, that's probably because you're, you're, you're living in sin. Oh, no, we're under grace. It doesn't matter. They actually told the pastor that. They were under grace. It didn't matter. They were living together. Is that right? Well, no wonder you got problems. Mark eleven twenty three does not say you can have anything you want. You can have what you say out of the realm of faith. Remember, Jesus said, have faith in God or the faith of God. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? But you have to measure that against James, where James says you have not because you ask not. 
or you ask amiss consuming it upon your own lust. In other words, there can be a misappropriation or a misapplication of trying to believe and confess for something. Amen. James said there was. <clears throat> and an interesting thing there is in Mark eleven twenty four, it says... Therefore, when you stand praying, believe that you receive uh, what things ever you desire. When you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have them. Amen. When you pray, the word pray is ateo, A-I-T-E-O in the Greek. The exact same word used over in James, it says, when you, when you ask, when, uh, when um, you pray, let's see, you have not because you ask not. Or you ask a message you may consume it upon your own lust. The word ask is ateo, A-I-T-E-O in the Greek. The same word pray in Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Exact same word in the Greek. So the Bible, whole counsel bears up that what things shall you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them, must bear up under the weight or the scrutiny of a scripture that says you cannot ask amiss or wrongly in order to consume it upon your own lust. In other words, there are parameters. There's a whole council that goes around that. In other words, if the Bible promises you something, whatever you desire that the Bible promises you, you can ask and receive that and you'll have it. Amen. But you just can't go believe someone else's wife. You can't believe someone else's car. Amen. Amen. Unless I guess you believe for them to get a better one, new one in the first place. Well, then if you're going to do that, you may as well believe it for yourself. Amen. So we have to let every scripture, all truth has to bear up under the, the counsel of the whole counsel of God's word. And you have to, I mean, it's just like uh, some of the extreme teaching on grace of I don't have to obey. Yet the word of God says in the New Testament, the Testament obey those with the rule over you. Amen. Well, how is it that you don't have to obey if the Bible says to obey? See, that, that, the position of grace that God, Jesus has done everything for you, there's nothing you can do to earn righteousness. No, you can't earn righteousness. But that still does not absolve you from obeying. Amen. When the scripture says to obey. So therefore, scriptures of grace about what Jesus has done for you, and you can't earn it, must bear up under the scrutiny of the whole council when it says obey. I don't have to go to church. And then the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. Amen. 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 So how, how you can't take that, um, that position when, and, and because the whole council must, it must bear up under the whole council. Amen. Amen. And so, <clears throat> for your life to be successful, and for you as a Christian to be ready for battle, you must make sure that what, you, what you're believing and standing on bears up under the weight and scrutiny of the whole counsel of God's Word. And the only way you're going to do that is to study yourself, uh, 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 workman, uh, study yourself approved, workman who needeth not to be ashamed. You need to study the Scriptures. You need to feed on the Word. You need to be in church. Amen. 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 Because if you're going to have uh, perfect and accurate and clear, I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm true and correct and pure and genuine truth, then you can't taint it with all. How many of you have ever done this? There's something you want in the Bible and you see something that kind of contradicts it and you just don't want to deal with the contradictory scripture. Come on, Come on now. You just, you just don't even want to deal with it. Well, it's not really contradictory. It is the, it is the scrutiny of balance from the whole counsel of the word. And when you run into that, you've got to stop. Yeah. And you've got to study that. And you've got to find the, the, the reconciliation of what seems, what seems in your theology is contradictory until you come to a pure and genuine understanding of what all that is. Amen. Now, we have people say, well, I can have what I say. I believe that Jesus is coming back on such and such. You can't call him back. Number one, there's no basis for faith. Where does faith come from? The Bible tells us itself that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Amen. And there is no scripture that gives you the faith to call Jesus back. Well, I can have what I say. See, there you go again. If you don't take the whole counsel of the Word of God, you start running around, I can have what I say, I can have what I say, I can have what I say, and start trying to misapply that to consume it upon your own lust or your own personal desires, you're going to get into error. Amen. <clears throat> what happens then? If your truth, if, the, if, the, if your loins are girt about with truth, 
and truth is out of kilter or not rightly, you're going to have parts of your armor not connected right. Amen. That's going to make you susceptible to attack from the enemy. So getting this point right to start with is imperative. Amen. We must come to a genuine and correct and, uh, and, and true and pure perspective of the Word of God. Amen. That means that you, you just can't grab something and run off with it and not take the time to study it out, rightly divide it, Come on now. Well, that's more work, preacher. It is. Well, do you want to be hooked up right when you face the enemy or you won't go out there half cocked? Amen. Hello? Amen. I'm going to tell you, half cocked against the enemy is not a good idea. Amen. You want to be hooked up. Amen. You want to be right. Amen. You want to be prepared. Amen. You want to have everything in place. Amen. Going out there all, you know, half cocked and think you got it all together. I got my one scripture, you know. And one scripture is enough if it's rightly divided. If it's rightly understood in proper context. Amen. We jump off on things sometimes, run off the deep end with it. We got people running around preaching stuff and manipulating people and, yeah. and people listen to one, I mean, one thing, you know, and all, you know, we had, we had the, the pray one hour movement a few years ago. There were more people in condemnation about how much they pray than, than, than ever before. Man, Somebody asked Wigglesworth, and Wigglesworth, 20th century apostle of faith, <clears throat> he said, how long do you pray? He said, you pray an hour a day? He said, I don't know if I pray an hour a day, but I never go an hour without prayer. I'm not against praying an hour. They took Jesus where Jesus needed something said you couldn't pray. In other words, you're so given to your flesh you can't even pray. I, I'm in need now you can't pray an hour. It wasn't that the hour was some magical thing about the hour. It was there was a need there and he needed them to overcome their flesh and pray through some things. They were, but they couldn't even pray an hour. They were, just, they were just so fleshly given. They fell asleep in an hour. It was just, it, it, it was not, the, it was not the hour was some kind of special metaphoric powerful thing. You got one hour is going to get it done, pal. One hour might not get it done. Three hours might and 20 minutes might not. Five minutes might. Amen. We got to learn to be led by the Spirit. So, having your loins girt about with truth. So, when, when, when getting the truth right, again, this is not epinosis. This is a, a aletheia. Aletheia, A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A. Uh, and again, referring to true and correct, pure and genuine. Now, when you get pure and genuine truth, that means you remove your slant. Come on now. Amen. Your manipulation of something to make it say what you want it to say. That means you take every scripture and you say, how does this bear up under the counsel of the Word of God? Not to my narrative, but to the Word of God. Because I'm going to tell you something. You'll, you're going to find this out. As you go through life and you mature and you, you understand the scriptures more, there are going to be things you thought, yeah, I had a handle on this. You're going to look at it and go, oh my God. When more revelation and more lights come, you go, I, I manipulated that in my believing system because it, it, I made it say what I wanted it to say. When it really says this. You just can't take things and make them say what you want them to say. Now, let me, let me give you one. How does God answer prayer? Well, in Him all the promises are yea, and in Him, amen. You go read that in a different translation. It says, it's all the promises of God. Find the yes in Him. And our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. In other words, His, prom his promises are always yes to us, but it takes our, so be it, our agreement with it for it to go into operation in our life. It's not that the promises are yes and amen and they're going to work for us no matter what. It is, yeah, his promises are have a yes on them. But it takes our agreement, our coming into agreement with that by saying amen. Amen and so be it. In other words, it is, a, it is a confession of agreement. And our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. So what happens there is, you know, instead of having a, a thing that, you know, where we look at it and go, yeah, God always says yes and amen to everything I do. No, 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 no. He says yes, but it's, it requires our coming into covenant and agreement with it for it to work. See, it's, that's, that's not quite the same as the perspective of, yeah, they're always yes and amen. Hallelujah. 
No matter what. No, you, his, he's yes, but you got to agree. Amen. So that's, 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 so that's whole counsel. We have to take the whole counsel. Everybody say whole counsel. Whole counsel. Come on, one more time. Whole counsel. All right. When we do this, then we position the most important stabilizing factor of the armor properly in place in our life. When we, rightly, when we do this, when we rightly divide the word of truth, when we study it, we take it, and we take it in complete accuracy to the rest of the Bible. And do not make the mistake. I'll tell you, you're going to set yourself back years doing this. When you come across a scripture that goes contrary to what you think you believe about the Bible, and you go, <laughs> and kind of, <laughs> that, no, with that point, that, that is there, that point, you can count that point to stop, to rightly divide the word of truth, to let the whole counsel of the good. I can tell you, anything that you, that you believe that's worth believing can stand up under the scrutiny of the whole counsel. If what you believe cannot stand up under the scrutiny of the whole counsel of the Word of God, it ain't worth believing. Because it won't work. I said it won't work. Y'all hear you going home. It has to, you have to take the whole counsel. You have to take the things you don't like. I may have things in the Bible you see you don't like. I got faith I can move mountains. How to do you? I don't need people. What the Bible says faith without love. Amen. Or faith, actually, it says that faith works by love. <clears throat> you can't get around walking in love. Yeah, right. You don't, your faith won't work. Yeah, How about this one? Faith without corresponding actions is dead being alone. Now, when the Bible says works, King James says works. But when Paul talks about faith and works, and James talks about faith and works, they're talking about two different things. James is talking about the works. You know, show me, I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, corresponding action. Paul's talking about the law. Mm -hmm. Paul didn't sacrifice animals, didn't slay them, put them on the altar and go to the priest and all that kind of stuff. So Paul was, talking, Paul was in reference to the works of the law. James is talking about actions that correspond to your faith. He says, somebody comes to your house naked and destitute and hungry. You go, be fed and, hung and, and well clothed and go your way. You're under grace. That's what, now James said that he didn't say in the grace, but I'm, I just kind of threw that in there. I like to rib the people who just, because there's some people that are just so extreme that, you know, that they can't even breathe right. James says, somebody comes to you naked and hungry and you just say, be warned and be filled and go your way. Um, <clears throat> that's not faith. I confessed over them. He said, faith without works is dead being alone. Faith without corresponding action is dead being alone. Get them some food and get them some clothes. Well, I'm in faith. Yeah, and James said, faith without your corresponding action is dead. Amen? It's lifeless. So let's get, we got to get the truth thing right. Amen? Okay. <clears throat> and then he says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now understand, you know, um, the Roman breastplate covered the front and then it, it kind of was a hinge. It fell, it fell across the front and the back and strapped together here and then tied to the belt. Why? Because when you're running, if it wasn't tied to the belt, it would flop up and down. You know, how many of you ever, has, you know, ever, ever ran with something on a coat, loose coat, something, and it flops up and down? Or, you know, football, shoulder pads won't tight enough. They run, they just flopping up and down while you're running down the field, and that's just aggravating, you know. <coughs> and, um, and so you have on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, right standing, righteousness, justice, there's different translations for that. Um, but understand, what did the breastplate do? It covered or protected the vital organs, the heart. And see, the righteousness of God protects your spiritual vital organs, protects your spirit. Your understanding of who you are in Christ is crucial to the protection of your heart. You need to know who you are in Christ, what it means to be in Christ, what it means to be in Him, that you have a stand. You know, I understand your authority is vested in your righteousness. The authority of the believer is based on who you are in Christ. Amen. And you will not take positions of, of, um, of authority if you don't know who you are. Amen. You have to protect your heart. 
And the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, the Old Testament, and the psalmist says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I think the Proverbs, David said that. Out of it are the issues of life. You have to guard, it's a righteousness, understanding who you are, who you, how you're clothed, what position you have in God, the authority you have as a believer, how you can stand before God justified from sin, righteous, covered in the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. This is imperative to the protection of your vital spiritual life. Because if you believe that you're an old sinner saved by grace, you won't take your stand. If you believe... You know, that you're just a sinner, so you're just a stranger in this old world. And one of these old days, I want you to know when I cross over to the other side. Hallelujah. I'll be righteous with him. I would say you're righteous now. Amen. You, you will not be able to live in victory without an understanding of who you are in Christ Jesus now. Amen. 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 And this is not, I understand, this is not in, in, in a theological dispute against doing what the Bible says do. Amen. As a matter of fact, I do what the Bible says do because of my position of authority. Amen. It empower, and my position of authority enables me to do what the Bible says do in a fallen world with the God of this world ruling over the hearts of men and women. And I'm able to stand up by the authority of, of God in Christ Jesus as the righteousness of God in Christ and stand my place of victory and declare who I am and win over the devil, glory to God. And he doesn't have access to my heart, praise God, because I'm a new creature in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And so being covered in the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus empowers me and covers and protects all my vital, my spirit man. That's my vital spiritual organ, my spirit man. He is the heart of man in, 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 in uh, uh, allegorical sense. Amen. When the Bible talks about the heart of man, he ain't talking about the boom, 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 boom. It's talking about your spirit, the center of man. His essence. Man is a spirit. He, he has a soul. He lives in a body. The Bible says the body without the spirit is dead. Amen. Amen. And so the breastplate of righteousness is designed to cover. When you are covered in the righteousness of God in Christ, you're vital. You're, you're, you're protected. Because it's not, the devil can't bring an accusation against you. You understand that? See, outside of his righteousness, he can accuse you. And the accuser of the brethren is constantly accusing you. But I want you to know that when you're covered in the righteousness of God in Christ, he can't bring an accusation against you that'll stick, that'll hold, that'll stand. Glory to God. He can come against you and say, Ed Taylor did such and such on such and such date at such and such time with such and such. And the Lord says he's under the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You can't, you can't attack him. You, can't, you have no access to his heart. You have no access to him. He's covered in the righteousness of God in Christ. And, you know, he doesn't st I don't stand before God. I don't stand before God and go, you know, Lord, I, I, I paid back $15 million for what I did in the past. And I can stay. No, I, I come... And now I've been clothed. My righteousness is as filthy rags. I've laid that aside. I've taken up his. I've been born again. And so now Satan is denied access of accusation and authority over my heart because I'm under the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I say he's denied access because of that. And it's a protection. It covers me. It protects me. From spiritual onslaught, a deathly spiritual wound. Because I'm under the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. He's not permitted there. Because he can't, he can't accuse Jesus of anything. And that's whose righteousness I'm clothed in. Hallelujah. And he, the Bible says it calls him the accuser of the brethren. He does not accuse Jesus. Amen. amen. I said, Amen. He can't accuse Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus goes, Hey, look over there. I got the crown. I got man's crown of glory sitting right over here. Right there. Look at there. Look at there, devil. You come. Look at there. I done whooped you once. And for all, I don't need to get up and whoop you again. You've been whooped. Amen. amen. 
And so he says here, the having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, what does that mean? We live our life from a perspective that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We exercise our spiritual authority as a believer from that position. We do not fight our battles from how great we are or how wonderful we are or how many people we've brought to the Lord. We do not fight our battles from the fact we're the best Christian in the church. We fight our battles from the position that we're the righteousness of God in Christ. He has granted unto us um, uh, um, <laughs> what is that word? I just lost that total word. You can sign for somebody else. Power of attorney to use the name of Jenkins. I think I went totally blank. Power of attorney to use the name of Jesus. Praise God. And so when Satan comes, I don't go, hey, I'm Ed Taylor. I'm ready to bring you on. No. In the name of Jesus. And see, you will not be able to do that and understand that unless you know who you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so putting on the right, the, the, the breastplate of, of, of righteousness is coming to an understanding of who you are in Christ. And the righteousness that you now stand in is a righteousness that's been given to you through Jesus Christ because you, became, you were born again and you accepted him as Lord, praise God. Amen. And you win your battles knowing who you are. <clears throat> it amazes me how many people lose things because they don't know who they are. This is a good time for my old story story of the guy and, and that was uh, in, in, high, in my elementary school, middle school, middle school, he had failed two grades. So when we, were in the, when we were in the sixth grade, he was supposed to be in the eighth. And when we were in the eighth grade, he was supposed to be in the tenth. And um, he was a bully. He was a bully. Now, you understand, when you're in the sixth grade and you're supposed to be in the eighth, uh, you're a lot bigger than a lot of the kids. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they're two years old, and that's a, that's a real growing stage. And so, in the sixth grade, he started bullying me. I mean, I was, I was demanded and commanded to carry his books around. I was commanded to turn around, let him take paper clips on rubber bands and pop me on the backside. Just whatever he wanted to do, I was supposed to do. Well, that worked in the sixth and seventh grade. But then, and let's understand, when a bully has you bullied, you don't see yourself the way you are. Yeah. You don't see yourself grow. You don't see yourself mature. <clears throat> you see yourself through the eyes of the bully. And so sixth grade, seventh grade, I do all this all the time. I mean, I'm into the eighth grade. But one day, hallelujah, in the eighth grade, I got fed up. Amen. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you, most Christians wait till they get fed up to find out who they are. Why well, wait? And I'm going to be honest with you, the Bible tells us that, that, that we, will, we will stand in awe when Satan is thrown into the pit. And we will, this will be the statement. Is this he who calls the nations to tremble? Yeah. There's a lot of Christians who have been bullied by the devil their whole life and throughout, through, through the centuries. Who when the devil is thrown into the pit, they're going to go, that's the one that bullied us around? That's the one that caused all the problems? And we put up with that? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my, 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 my uh, bully friend, yeah, I really can't call him a friend, but my bully person, one day came in and said, turn around. He had a rubber band with a paper clip on it. And I said, I'm not going to do it. Now, I hadn't quite figured out who I was yet, but I'd had it. And I decided that I was drawing a line in the sand. You're going to come a place in your life, you're going to draw a line in the sand, and you're going to figure out you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and you have authority over him. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The Greek word for flee from you is flee from you as in terror. So all he's been doing to you is bullying you. Trying to keep you out of the revelation of who you are. What authority you have. And so he said, he said, all right, you meet me outside after school today. I said, I'll be there. Boy, I was shaking. I shook the rest of the day. I mean, I had the knee knocker problem, you know. But I'll tell you what, I was out there early. I was psyching myself up. Boy, I decided that this is it. We're, we're, I mean, the rubber's going to meet the road. The fist is going to meet the head. Something's going to come out of this. But this is the day I, got, I stopped getting hit with rubber bands, uh, paper clips on the end of rubber bands. And our, and our middle school was the old high school in Aiden, North Carolina. And it was a two-story with steps in it. I mean, it didn't meet code anymore, obviously. We had steps to go up to the second floor, that stuff. And, he, and, then, and then when you got down to the first floor, the steps came down to the ground. You know, that's how they did stuff back then. 
And um, I was outside outside the bottom steps, about 15 feet away from the, the last step. And I saw him come out of school. He started down the steps. I threw my books down, threw my coat off one way, and I went at him fist up, coming at him like a bull in a china shop. I'm telling you, I was getting ready to take him out. I mean, by the time, by the time that I got in there, I'd gotten more puffed and more ready and more psyched. And you know what his response was? Whoa, 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 no, 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 no. See, what he knew that I didn't know was that between the sixth and eighth grades, I'd gained about 40 or 50 pounds and he hadn't. I had shot up three or four inches and he hadn't. I was bigger than him and I didn't know it because I still saw myself out there in the sixth grade with the eighth grader. And he started hollering, whoa, no. And I said, that's it. You won't ever touch me again. You won't ever do this. And I just laid the law down to him. He never bothered me again the rest of my life. Because, you know, between then and high school, I gained another 45 pounds. I went from 160 as a freshman to 205 as a senior. I kept getting bigger and stronger, and he stayed the same. He had stunted his grade. He's a smoker. He was smoking in the eighth grade. I guess he stunted his growth. He, he didn't grow anymore after the eighth grade. He stayed the same. You know, he never got in my face again. Sure. And that's how, the, now the devil will try, keep trying to come back. Let me tell you, the devil's like the Wizard of Oz. He sits and runs his little machine and stirs up trouble and tries to make you afraid and tell you how wonderfully bad he is. I mean, he is, he's awesome. He's the dude. He's going to whip you and all this kind of stuff. <coughs> and all the time, he's trying to keep you from finding out who you are. Because the day you find out who you are changes everything. When you put on that breastplate of righteousness and understand your authority as a believer, it changes everything. You're no longer subject to his authority, to his power. You, un you know, listen, you, you, well, I wasn't before. Yeah, well, you were, you made yourself subject to it. Because you capitulated. You laid down your arms. Hello? Never use, only drop once. You know, that's capitulation. The devil came, you screamed, hollered, and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> I won't pray. The devil's been after me all week. Praise his holy name. And I know they're really trying to say praise the Lord, you know, but oh, the devil's been after me all week. What's the devil been doing? Why ain't you been after the devil? You're supposed to have him on the run. Look out, devil, here we come. We're going to put you on the run. We're going to run you out of town. We're going to tear your kingdom down. So look out, devil, here we come. We're going to put you on the run. We're going to run you out of town. We're going to tear your kingdom down. I tell you, you got to have a mindset that the devil is not going to be able to whoop you. Yeah. The devil's not going to defeat you. The devil's not going to take you down. You're going to take him out. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. But that will only come when you know who you are in Christ. Because understand, <clears throat> Satan is a spiritual being. And in the natural, you're no match for him in the flesh. That's why the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, glory to God. And when you know who you are in Christ, you realize and come to a place of understanding that you have access to all that heaven has for you as a believer in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. If you don't have it, you need to get the mini book. And if we don't have it in the stock in the bookstore, we need to get it. The book In Him by Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth E. Hagin. Amen. Now understand, now, now that Dad's gone home, Pastor no longer puts Kenneth Hagin Jr. on his side. Because he was never Kenneth Hagin Jr. to start with. He was Kenneth W. Hagin. Right. But they used the, the junior to differentiate so people would know who they were without having to yeah. guess the middle initial. But now that Dad's gone, he, he's, he's just referring to himself as Kenneth W. Hagin now, which is, which is totally legitimate. Amen. Amen. Uh, but Kenneth E. Hagin's book, uh, In Him. It's a little mini book. It's not a big book. It won't take you long to read it. Now, it'll take you some time to go through all the scriptures. over 150 scriptures in there. But that's okay. Amen. That's how you rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. Amen. You study it all out. Yeah. Who you are in Christ. <clears throat> that revelation of who you are in Christ will bring you to a place of authority and a victory that you have not known heretofore. 
and a refreshing of that revelation. Listen, folks, people are going through hard times. People are facing difficult things. It's not a matter that you're failing in your faith. I tell you right now, I, I just, I, I know, I've just heard of a minister, who, and he, a minister that, that's, that's, you know, respected, went bankrupt. Issues, in the, issues against the finances of the church. Things can, not, nothing they've done, just they're standing, but you know, the, the, the attack of the enemy. It's not going backwards to keep fighting and do whatever you got to do to stand. Yeah. Amen. Keep fighting. Keep standing. Keep going. Amen. I said amen. And if you've, if you've let things go about who you are in Christ, go back and study him again. It's not, it is not foolish to refresh own understood revelation from the past. As a matter of fact, it's sensible to go back and look over it again, study it again, refresh yourself in it again. You'll get something new and deeper this time. That's how God's Word works. Amen? So to go back and study who you are in Christ and what it means to be in Christ, you know, well, I've studied that in the past. So what? Study it again. Maybe there's something there that you've been missing that's keeping you out of what you need to be in right now. And you can find it when you go back and study it again. So I, I encourage you, get that mini book and study it. Look up all those scriptures. Feed on those scriptures. Let the righteousness of God be made manifest in you. Amen. You'll probably find out that Duke is wrong and Carolina's right when you study that book. <laughs> I know that that revelation is there. Oh man, that's, that's probably one of those things where you rightly, rightly divide the word of truth, isn't it? Hallelujah. And it's not that Duke is right and Carolina's wrong, I can tell you that. That's not, that's not rightly dividing. Hallelujah. I had to say that. <coughs> I've already taken heat and Carolina won. I mean, how do, you, how do you take heat when Carolina wins? Anyway, I mean, I can understand that they lost, they won, and, I, and I'm taking heat because they won. I'm drinking that Duke Kool-Aid around here. Hallelujah. But understand, so go back, go back and get your book. You won't find anything about Carolina Duke in that book. <laughs> Unless I write the, the, uh, 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 the appendix or the uh, addendum. And if, you, if I write the addendum, you'll get one. You'll get the joke about, you know, K going to heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anyway, when you study and get a revelation and maintain that position and revelation of who you are in Christ, then it protects you in your spirit from the accusations of the enemy. Who do you think you are? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Who, who, what makes you think you can tell me what to do? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I've got the authority. I've been given power of eternity to use the name of Jesus. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Hallelujah. In him I live and move and have my being. Can you say amen? It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You find yourself riding around going, I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Old things are passed away. I've been born again. More than a conqueror. That's who I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Well, glory to God. <laughs>